All righty. Thanks a lot. So today we're finishing off model-free model policy search. And we're really going to start with one thing which is quite amazing. And um, well, before we get into it, we need to quickly review where our key difficulties were when you look at well, yesterday. Since in the end, optimizing the average reward is generically difficult. Right? Generically, we have a non-convex, non-linear optimization problem. And much of what we, we have been trying to do uh, in the past is actually to get at least to cost functions which were more friendly. I mean, already the way we do expiration gives us usually even a more friendly, uh, smoothened version of the cost function. What we're going to do today is we're going to, to try to reformulate everything with the simpler convex cost functions. And this really brings us to first a quote from psychology. So in psychology, there are these people who well, study how humans make decisions, and they, um, some of them put humans into stochastic scenarios and already a really, really long time back. And we found this really amazing quote. I'm going to read it to you. When learning from a set of their own trials and iterated decision problems, humans attempt to match not the best taken action, but the reward-weighted frequencies of their actions and outcomes. Now, that should in the first moment be totally counterintuitive. Because it basically says, OK, let's say you have a Q function and what a human does is not jump to the maximum of the Q function, but he will actually use this Q function as a weight on the past policy and simply reweight the actions he has done before, he or she has done before, using that Q function. So it, initially, this should feel really, really wrong, but if you do a very simple version of that, and you just basically say, OK, let's have the extreme case, let's have the have the case where we have a reward, which well, a return, so the sum of all rewards to come, which can either be one or not, and we don't actually, we only care about the, where one means for us basically optimal. And um, well, we would like to actually match, re reinterpret the regular reward as this kind of a probability of reaching the optimal reward. Now intuitively, if you had all the actions, all these states, this would actually correspond to saying that, well, we have these guys which are all candidates for being optimal because they got a, a reward of one, and these guys all got a reward of either zero or minus one, and um, so there would be the opposite binary event. And the reward function, which we had in the past, would actually just be an improper probability distribution corresponding to that P. So that case, you could compute a new um, could, would, could try to compute a new trajectory distribution by reweighting the old one with basically just the returns of the uh, trajectory. And with a, well, the re latent reward would be the 0, 1, 1. Now, if we do this for this intuitive bend of uh, like scenario here, well, we would actually end up with a distribution which captures most of the successes. But if for one particular state we only have a uh, well, we only have a failure, we would actually rather capture the failure than try out something crazy to the top or to the bottom. And so that really makes quite a difference. The first time we ever observed th that this was useful was actually totally heuristically. It was in, robo in a robotic scenario. So this here is the D uh, BDI little dog, which back then was distributed across all over North America. Uh, sorry, all over the US, not in Canada, because it's military money, and they, uh, many teams were competing with it. And one of the biggest problems with it is, is it was a very stiff robot at that time, and you, when, when you placed your feet badly, you would roll over, and you had already lost, and that meant one bad trial run in the next, uh, well, in this month competition. So learning where to place your feet was quite quite essential, and if you gave it a reward um, based on the amount of slippage, you could actually come up with a really, really good reward function. But obviously, this is not a trivial learning problem. 
So we first treated it as a well, kind of a bended version, version of the problem from before. So um, just you place the feet once, you see how much it slips, and you transform the slippage into a, re into a, um, well, a, re a reward function, a positive one, since um, slip, obviously the least slip is what you would like to have. And subsequently, you would reweight all of the uh, possible foot placements, obviously. And it worked pretty much out of the box. Now, we didn't know at that point why this worked so well. We only started to understand it by the success matching a moment later. Yes, sir, you had a question. It, it, it would work, so the question is whether it would work in general or is it whether it only works with the delayed or final reward. And no, you can actually make the whole math work in general so that you do a, um, that you have actually a Q function in there. For example, an actor critic setup is possible. Jens Kobov wrote a whole PhD thesis at how to do this best. Um, it's worth looking into that one still today. There's also a nice um, survey paper around and on this, these kind of approaches. Alrighty, so now we have this scenario and we will obviously have to understand it now better. And well, the success matching is actually, well, is actually really corresponds to uh, well, treating the true reward as a probability distribution. And it basically, most of the times we do this transformation of um, a reward which we've had before, which quite frequently, well, doesn't correspond, for example, could be negative, like in, in LQR, could be, uh, well, or could not look too much like a probability distribution. We most of the times we transform it by an exponential function with some parameter eta. And the amazingly cool part is that quite a few methods can be derived directly from this kind of a principle. For example, EM-like methods as um, starting thing with the very early work by Peter Dayan and then really being continued by both Mark Tussong and well, my PhD student Jens Kober and a little bit by me worked that way. You can derive optimal control from a first order perspective if you look at Evangelos Theodoros methods in there and if you look at um, for example Christian Daniels approaches on um, information geometry he they also directly come from that point of view. So what's the basic idea here? Well, the basic idea is actually quite a cool one. The basic idea is that, well, we treat the reward as a latent variable, we even treat the trajectories is, um, as, well, the success of trajectories is unknown, but we use the reward as a, well, as a, improper probability distribution. If we don't know, of course, the trajectory with the highest success. Now, if we do this, we can actually do this very EM-like, since we can now write down the log probability of our reward, given whatever policy parameters we have, which, well, is just gonna be the um, reward, just gonna be the lo a lower bound on the, ac on the actual reward based on the samples we've seen so far, Q, and uh, having the new policy parameters in here. And additionally, we have, of course, the KL as the difference between the, the uh, distribution we, uh, sorry, the new distribution we would be generating and the one which we have would have given the reward and the policy parameters. Now, if we plug this in, well, we obviously get a variational distribution and um, could write down this posterior over trajectories given re the reward and well, the, the true optimality reward and the parameters. So we're basically directly in the EM framework right, while at the same time solving, we are solving the reinforcement learning problem. That actually is a very powerful thing to do because the EM framework is a framework which is generically safe. 
it enables us to uh, do policy updates and not feel we are going to threaten our life by having a robot with a two kilogram wrist move rapidly to, uh, to a crazy location at a rapid acceleration. So it's really quite powerful to directly stay in this framework. It's also powerful because we have way fewer tuning parameters than you would normally have, starting from a learning rate, but also going into a lot of other directions. So once you follow, of course, this EM-like approaches, well, what you need to make sure is that your lower bound is tight. So for that, we do the E step, where we first minimize this distance between the uh, posterior of the, our trajectory distribution and um, our and the new trajectory distribution. If we can do this perfectly for our family of distributions, like if it's in the exponential family, uh, we can actually directly use this solution. Otherwise, we have to obviously do an approximate variational step. After that, this bound would actually be tight, and we recognize that this guy here would, of course, be zero, and we only would have to optimize this guy. So that brings us to the M step. Now the M step is of course a safe thing to do because in the M step, all we're maximizing now is this uh, function L. And this function L is a lower bound on our original reward, expected return. And well, we see directly when we now plug in the posterior here that this arc max over the parameters of that distribution directly corresponds well, an arc max of actually only a small part of this whole uh, area because here is no theta, here is no theta. So we basically only have the theta in this component. So we can actually just do an arc max on samples where we now take the rewards, we reweight the log probabilities of the past. And we, from this, have the maximum like weighted maximum like the log likelihood objective. Now that was incredibly surprising for us that um, this worked out so beautifully when uh, we, we first derived these things. What is really, really cool about it is that when you're starting at a location you know, and you're now creating a lower bound at this location, well, obviously, you can maximize it. You get a new lower bound which you can again maximize. And uh, you can do this, if you do it in the, M fam in the exponential family, you can actually do it in closed form. So if otherwise, if you can't do it in closed form, if you're, for example, outside the exponential family, if you're not and then you would obviously have to um, iterate, like in a mixture model, you would have to, uh, like, you know, like in your network, for example, you would have to do some gradient steps for the max operators in both cases, actually. But what we really nicely have here is that we have no open parameters at this point. We actually have it that we are guaranteed to go to at least a local optimum. And what's even the nicest, we get second order convergence speed. So we are as fast as any Hessian method would be just without actually that, put, uh, that additional parameter, uh, uh, this additional Hessian matrix. With the disadvantage, of course, that we have to be more careful about how we choose our exploration. So the simplest scenario, of course, would be, let's say we just do Gaussian exploration, and let's say we do this just on the parameters, not even directly on the actions, and, well, we would directly see if you do EM on a Gaussian, you would get a weighted mean, and you would get a weighted covariance matrix, where our weights would now be, well, our reward transformation, which, uh, well, has turned our reward into an improper probability distribution. You can, in fact, apply this to a lot of different models. So you can apply this to mixture models. It works quite well there. You can apply it to GPs. It works quite well there. Uh, and, um, yeah, Gaussians are just, for illustrative purposes, usually the best. It corresponds, of course, to directly matching the moments of, in this case, the parameter exploration policy and the distribution over the parameters given that we would like to have an optimal reward. 
So now this gives us the maximum likelihood objective, which is when you look at it up to here, it is just the um, objective of the expected return of the old policy plus, well, oh no, sorry, times this log probability, which is now a function of theta, where theta is not the old policy, but it's actually the new policy that we can maximize. If you take the derivative of this, you can actually quickly see that this derivative is actually the same as the one of the policy gradient. So we can actually rederive the policy gradient theorem directly also from that um, EM perspective. Since when you look at the average re edge return objective, you derive the policy gradient and you see, oh, this is nearly the same, except that in the EM-like methods, we can actually set this gradient to zero and do a larger step. So the key difference here is really that, um, well, or the reason why we can do this is really this reward transformation, which has turned this all into a probabilistic scenario. First problem where we are, I'm now gonna show to you where this was applied um, is the problem of the underactuated swing up. So for the ones of you who have never heard about it, simplest thing is um, think of the mountain car problem, but um, don't think of the hand wavy made up version, but of one which um, control and robotics people actually can write down and can build very, very easily and where it will look the same over pretty much all robots. So the key idea is I have only one degree of freedom and for this one degree of freedom, I well have a, like, a, in a, like just a one degree of freedom robot. So you could, could have a, like well, the pointer on a watch and you have not enough torque to actually turn the pendulum all the way up, just like you don't have enough uh, force to push up the car and the mountain car problem. And so you have to go back and forth and bring it to the top. So in this case, we have the huge advantage. We can write down physics. Physic, nobody can argue with physics um, as a problem. We can, of course, um, directly say, this is our motor brake. And then we can give it a reward function, which you can find in the literature actually of more than 20 years ago. Now we start, in this case, with a demonstration. And subsequently, um, let this um, uh, system do self-improvement. So the demonstration actually shows a behavior without a torque limit, just enough that you have one header reward at the top. And it will try to reproduce that one, it will fail. But after subsequent trials, it figures out, well, if you have a little bit of energy in there, you can make it higher up. At some point you make it up high enough, but you overshoot. And actually in classical control, you would separate these two things. You would create an energy-based controller for bringing you up. And you would um, then subsequently use, um, um, well, kind of a feedback controller, PD controller to stay at the top. Of course, we in learning want to do this in one, one framework together. And well, that's how you why this is actually well, a separate and hardwiring problem. It's quite nice to see how um, that in the beginning, policy gradients actually do a bit better in the first couple of steps, but it's because they can make faster use of the data for than the EM-like methods, but the EM-like methods actually manage to do bigger steps and get to a much higher performance as the method power, which you see up here. The second problem, well, we had have ball in the cup. So we have a little ball on a string. You can move around a cup and well, you can bring the ball up into the, you're supposed to bring the ball up into the cup. And there is a ton of different ways of doing that. In fact, in the country of Japan, they have competitions on that. And the, there are professional, they call it kendama, they're professional kendama players and the professionals actually do it out of the knees so that they get a very reproducible behavior. Um, now we looked at how humans do it, but in the end we gave it a relatively simple reward, just the reward of proximity between ball and cup um, in, the, in a plane which we could very easily observe with our cameras. What you see here, 
is, well, the amount of return um, you get from that um, reward. And then, well, what you see here now is how the behavior was learned. So we start out with a demonstration and um, the robot will try directly try to reproduce it. But the robot has no hand-eye coordination after the, at this stage, since from one trial you cannot learn hand-eye coordination. Um, it has a two kilogram wrist, so it cannot produce the accelerations of the human. So it has to actually figure out a slightly different strategy. After around 40 something trials, we usually make it into the cup for the first time. And after about 90 trials, we usually become perfect. In fact, we've had it that we had um, a very senior meeting of, of well, the old people from the oldest people from robotics, you could say. Um, so about 60, the very established roboticists meeting, thing for whatever reason at Max Planck, and we showed it um, for a whole day to uh, obviously like two or three of them at once who were coming to visit our lab. And it worked every single time that um, we had the ball in the cup was successful in the cup after uh, uh, for a well-trained policy. So it really works incredib worked incredibly well. Now, how does this compare to humans? My PhD student Jens Kober went, well, he presented it at NIPS and then he said, I'm going home for Christmas and I have a lot of cousins. And I looked at him, really, a lot of cousins? Why are you telling me this right now? Um, and was, was quite confused and then he came back and he had a video with his cousins and it was really quite cute because he had filmed them all learning ball in the cup and um, he'd used chocolate as a reward, <laughs> which was very effective. Um, so the, it turned out though that the six to eight year olds didn't manage to learn the task at all. The 10 to 12 year olds managed to learn it actually quite well. So they took 30 something trials. And so they were a slight bit better than our algorithm, but they never reached a perfect performance. And the grown ups managed to do it within three, four trials. So it seems to be only me who took three months to learn it. <laughs> I should add though, some of these cousins cheated and we could see this on the video. So I guess chocolate is too strong an incentive since I've never seen our robot cheat. <laughs> Jens has actually since then done more ball in the cup and um, his best algorithms today can learn it actually, obviously now using a learned model on the way and a lot of, of other things, um, the smarter type of feedback, uh, he can learn it within seven trials, which is quite amazing when you think about it. So this of course, learns one type of um, episodic policy. Now, yesterday you guys learned about hierarchical reinforcement learning. And in, that is obviously something which in robotics we need more than anywhere else. Since our, well, in the end, we want to recycle as much as we can because we have very, very sparse data. And data is, as you guys know already from the T-ball scenario yesterday, it is really, really quite painful because somebody has to pick up the ball, put it back on the stick, reset the robot, reset uh, the, bring the, com reactivate everything. So it's actually taking a lot of time for us. With the result, of course, that we want to reuse as many of the policies as we can. So one of the worst things you could do if you wanted to learn, a, let's say, a game of darts, so I don't know how popular dart games are in Canada. They're actually not that popular in Germany either, but we learned in the UK about them, about this round the clock dart game where you have to always throw a dart to that yellow dot. And um, well, we at that point decided we trained just a single policy. This policy should just become really, really good at throwing a dart to one location. And then subsequently, we actually learned how to modulate it by having an additional meta parameter, which allows us to do now generalization to, well, different dart throwing locations and therefore actually learn a complete dart game. Gotta admit, we totally underestimated darts at that point. Um, the first thing which happened when we did this on, we tried to do this on our Barrett-Wham robot, 
was that it, it we just showed it the just the demonstration and the demonstrations alone created a reverse current on the motors which was so strong that it fried the american style power electronics and we had to actually and the manufacturer was really really nice they redesigned the power electronics for us so but after that we didn't dare to do this on our own robot anymore so we visited, I mean, this is a good thing when you have friends, so we visited our friends. Um, so we have friends in Japan, and they have this wonderful humanoid robot. And this humanoid robot had, of course, two advantages. One is it was a hydraulic robot. Hydraulics has much better force generation properties. And it has a hand, which is very lightweight, so that we can actually also control the release of the timing of the release of the dart. So here you now see, hopefully, yeah, you can see the performance of the dart throwing of um, this humanoid robot. And it is about as scary as it looks. <laughs> <laughs> Since if this thing would fall on you, that would be quite heavy. Uh, and well, you'd basically see how the how it releases the dart, how it throws to a pre-prescribed pre location, and it actually played about as good as a 12-year-old child or a tenured professor. <laughs> now that's of course the simplest form of hierarchy, right? You just use, oh sorry, there's a question. So there are additional cameras on the sides. Um, in, in most cases, working with the, I mean, think about this, the head is shaking. You have to actually, would have to learn now in addition to uh, simply hand-eye coordination, you would actually have to learn all the visual reflexes and there would be a ton more problems in there. Now at, at ATR in Japan with our friends, they actually studied these things of how to learn visual reflexes and um, similar to us humans. And there's surprisingly many which we need, right? I mean, we have the VOR, which makes sure that, that how we, we move our body doesn't affect our, how we stabilize on the retina. Then we have the T TKR, so the, how much we move the neck doesn't affect the retina. And you can continue this as there's, I think, a concert of 15 reflexes, uh, which makes sure that we can actually do these things. Yes, and they have to. It's a good point with the chickens. Chickens have to be really much better even than humans with this. The humans have this huge advantage that our eyes both point to the front. So we can actually do stereo vision and we have redundancy here when we do stereo vision. Now chicken have their eyes to the side. There's no overlap between the eyes. So their um, stereo vision arises from them moving their head, um, which is a totally different way of how you, well, how you get um, depth perception. And um, for that reason, um, chickens have to actually be, have much, much better stabilization there too. So we obviously have a visual pre-processing step in there. So we don't do end to end um, here. And well, I, do I do not recommend end to end, to be honest. Um, I do think it's, it would be v it's very wise to create many layers of unsupervised learning to get a good representation. Um, but ideally, we make that completely independent from, uh, well not completely independent, but largely independent from the reinforcement learning step so that we can rather learn a concert of many different things with the reinforcement learning algorithms, but use one type of, um, of perception component and for the feature generation, at least in robotics, because getting, for example, l a large chunk of images is really easy, right? We can do this, for, we can just talk to the computer vision com community. Getting a large number of trajectories from simulation to get a geometric understanding is also really easy. But getting something which actually maps to real actions, that is where it gets really, really hard where we have very, very few data points and where we will never have many data points. 
And even if you create a farm of robots, like p so many people have done at Google, at, at Karlsruhe, at Munich, I mean, there's this ton of people who have created these farms. Just this data, these data sets are not very useful. Uh, because the changes in wear and tear and, and the constraintness of these situations basically make sure that you cannot generalize to a lot of situations. And while we humans generalize from one or two examples, uh, so we quite clearly have a much better use of our perception, perception of the system than you can do by well, just creating massive action data. Further questions? Alrighty, then I continue. Good. Now, this was one way of doing hierarchy. And um, another way, way of doing hierarchy you guys learned about yesterday. That's the idea of options. And I wouldn't say it's 100% options what um, we do in robotics. But what we do quite frequently is that we have a higher level policy which selects, um, well, you could call them options, just you don't leave them that frequently. Because when you're doing a selection operator, selecting an option is a discrete, oper is a discrete action. I either decide I use now the policy to run out of this room and grab a coffee, or to use the one to stay here and keep lecturing. Well, you guys guess which one I'm going to do. Um, but while the actual actions I generate would be the torques of me running out of here, and that's actually a continuous trajectory. So it's a substantially different uh, thing than the discrete actions at the higher level. But the damage discrete action, this discrete action does is of course enormous and much, mu much, much more damaging since once you've done a wrong decision, you should not revert from it. Unlike the option framework, you cannot leave the continuous policy easily. You have to actually figure out um, how you are allowed to abort it. And in that sense, it differs substantially from um, the way of how people view the options framework. So you cannot just randomly leave an option. But um, most cases, people who do this in robotics actually have it that um, a motor primitive, for example, terminates automatically when a particular goal is reached or the time has expired. So what we would have now here is that I can choose to, well, stay here, run out of the room, and hide behind the desk. And these events I've chosen between these three, I would then subsequently be able to take the actions and, well, and then produce them to the outside. But I could also do things like combining them if there is a compact way of doing so. Obviously, training such a policy is much, much harder. And the first, and maybe I should, before I go any into this, is and you cannot just start from scratch at all anymore. You really have to start with imitation, and you have to start with the actually creating the hierarchy which you want to have already in at least a preliminary version, initialization from the imitations. And for us, this was at a pretty, when we got into that, that was at a pretty, well, interesting stage. We had just done this ball in the cup thing, we had done the dart throwing, and, um, and we had shown it to our director, and our director said to us, yeah, Jan, that is all very nice, but when are you going to do something difficult? <laughs> now, you can imagine that that felt like a little beating in the gut. Um, and I asked him, well, what, uh, what actually do you consider difficult? And he said, oh, well, you know, I was a youth champion in table tennis. Why don't you do robot table tennis? <laughs> and you can obviously tell him then that a lot of people have done, worked on robot table tennis. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a very, very good benchmark task because it's like the real-time vision people created a $2 million chip at some point to create just tracking of balls in real time with analog electronics, and then chose a really, well, chose a, a, a industrial robot with a very long broomstick and managed to play table tennis, hacked up as a task, right? And they did actually be pretty okay with it. Or you can look at the, in the 1990s, there were competitions on robot table tennis, and they actually, converged to a pretty poor solution. They only had a paddle, 
and this pedal had a spring behind it, and they just moved the pedal so fast over to the right location where the ball would be coming and then released the catapult, um, obviously on a tiny table, so there wasn't on a real table tennis table, that would have been too dangerous, and they managed to play table tennis. So it's, it's not something you want to get in when you're in robotics, but what can you do? So I said, okay, but I'm at least gonna, I'm gonna use it only as a drosophila, so like the fly the biologist used, um, in order to show that this actually works for, well, learning whole uh, hierarchical policies by reinforcement learning. So here we start now by demonstration. And Katarina takes the robot by the hand, shows it, um, in this case, many different forehands, but she also shows um, other kinds of strikes. Subsequently, well, what we, we get is, well, basically demonstrations, really long ones, actually, consisting of, consisting of multiple strokes. And we have an EM-like imitation learning method, which segments this into many different substrokes, builds up now a library of primitives, and then for execution can actually rechain them. Importantly, it gives us both an initialization for the supervisor, so for the higher level, the options selection policy, as well as for the options. We have never managed to solve the problem of how to create new options past the imitation step. So we would create, but what we have did solve is we figured out how to eliminate bad ones, um, obviously by reinforcement learning, which works actually quite effectively. And um, so you really the imitation is actually quite important because it really gives us, um, well, the starting set of primitives. Here you see examples. So there is a forehand and a backhand primitive um, in this particular data set. So now let's see. This here is a player right after imitation learning, and it was actually surprisingly good. Since um, already against the ball gun, right after imitation learning, it manages to get 69% success rate against the ball gun where the human had trained it on. Well, that's pretty cool. And um, now, though, as a good robot teacher, we actually selected to, hit, to take the ball gun and always aim it at the locations where the robot was bad at and let the policy converge, both training the, high, the higher level and the lower level policies is at the same time. And well, it manages to go from 0% to 80%. And against the ball gun, it actually gets up to a performance of 97%. Finally, here you see the robot playing against its maker and um, Katarina actually told me she is a very proud computer scientist. She only learned table tennis for her PhD. <laughs> now, evil tongues could say the robot is about as good as she is. <laughs> yes. Um, so we basically designed our own vision system. So you see one camera here. This actually watches the opponent. Then there are cameras in this and this, and also, well, kind of in these and these corners, which all track the ball. And, and they actually have to do this in, it's actually still, it's actually quite amazing when we created the first vision system for the ball in the cup scenario, you know, back in the days, we bought the best real-time cameras you could get at the time. And um, now, 10 years later, well, the best cameras are pretty much the same. They have uh, for real time, for which you can read out in real time at a high speed it so that you can actually do real time vision on it. You have get maybe instead of VGA, you get maybe one megapixel now. And the real difficulty is getting the whole image out of the camera uh, in into the GPU in real time so that you can actually do uh, any step of vision in it. And even the GPU is, is quite at getting then a signal out in time. I mean, we're talking, two milli talking here at two milliseconds and is still actually quite an endeavor. So you only realize how m amazing things are done on your digital camera when they have optimized all of these steps um, directly in hardware when you try to do these things in software again. Also explains why the classical robotics people created analog vision systems with analog chips when they did table tennis in the early days. What was the 
So we gave it a reward for um, hitting the table. That was a binary one, a very big one. And then we gave it a smaller but smoother one for how close to the center of the, the area yeah, on the, the side of the opponent it would hit the ball. And that well, was a totally heuristic reward. Later, Katarina actually did a really amazing paper, which has been completely underappreciated so far. But she actually managed to get European, both European champion level as well as layman table tennis players into a lab. And she did inverse reinforcement running on them and figured out what reward functions do human table tennis players use. And she could show something which I found so cool, I wish we had sent it to, I don't know, Nature or Science, because it's, it's such a cool result. She figured out that there is actually, in terms of strategy, in terms of the upper level of the policy, there is no difference in the reward functions of the layman and the professionals, because both know, well, it would of course be great to trick your opponent by uh, shooting the ball into that or into that direction. They both know the good locations for it. But the real difference happens only at the lower level, at the execution level, where the big difference actually results from us being, well, when you're a bad player, you're not going to try the moves which require uh, you to be really good at it. So you will avoid actually the things which go beyond your ability. But your reward function directly reflects that, and it's only three of the um, 15 major features which you use for strategy, um, which have anything to do with your ability, and they're quite clearly very close to your motor ability, and they correspond to your own judgment in your motor ability directly and proportionally. So that was really one of the coolest, fasci most fascinating results we had there, and it's completely overlooked. I don't think too many people know it. Yes. Uh, can the robot switch back and forth between forward and back again? Yes, it can. So in this video, you, you watched very correctly, you, in this video it didn't do a lot of that. It's actually quite a scary move because when it, um, it basically goes with a two kilogram wrist from here to here. And if it does it while the ball is actually already quite close, it does it at an incredibly fast speed. And your, your heart really stops when you're sitting next to it. That actually brought my PhD student Jikun Wang to a really cool idea. So what Jikun did is he said, let's track the pl uh, human player on the other side. And when you track the human player on the other side, you can actually predict where the human will shoot the ball to. And he, can do this, he could do this incredibly well. He could actually predict with an accuracy of 30 centimeters where the human wanted to shoot the ball to already 300 milliseconds before the human had ever touched the ball. And that means basically when the human has just done this first bit or this first bit of his stroke, he could already tell where the human would be shooting the ball to. And that, is, that was of course then super cool and we created at some point that video where the robot would always lazily go into a waiting posture and then do the strike and then do the other strike and, um, and um, yeah, that's, that was a pretty cool result too. But it doesn't reflect so much here and on in this video because, uh, well, it's because it's, it avoid, when you don't do the opponent prediction, it'll try to do as much as it can with the forehand and only occasionally switch to the backhand. Other questions? Yes. Hmm? Yes. So why is it that the robot needs to be like calm so I'm basically like calling the pilot to do sort of things where it's not this Okay, so maybe we should back off one step before um, to actually bring in a, a few aspects here of robots versus humans. Um, so humans c have a few amazing abilities. So for example, we, we see badly. I mean, we don't look very, we don't see very accurately. We see actually also quite slowly, since um, our visual system works basically at 30 hertz. Um, now, in order to make a robot vision system work well, you, uh, you need at least 60 hertz, 200 hertz is actually better. Um, but then again, what we see with the robot is a bunch of pixels, and getting an accurate prediction of, of a trajectory from the pixels 
is actually harder than apparently what we humans get, since we humans already in the early visual circuits already create a prediction um, of moving targets, at least according to the people who study this in the sports sciences. And um, nearly anybody I've talked to who was a professional player say that they, can, they usually see the ball you know, ahead of time, see, like see a complete line of the ball moving where it will be in the future. So they, they really have some very good predictive model about the ball. Now how Jikun got actually triggered into watching the, well, into bringing in the human prediction. Also had in, uh, sorry, sorry, one more thing about difference between robots and humans. And our robot cannot accelerate as much as a human. Just think about this. Our robot has a two kilogram wrist. So imagine you were holding this um, as a wrist and then there's a pedal at the end. Instead of um, holding a pedal, it makes a huge difference. You will have a hard time playing. So it cannot accelerate like that. Also electric motors are not like muscles. In fact, I have a PhD student who builds a muscle-based robot just to compensate for that at the moment. Um, so you, you cannot cope with the accelerations of the human. The advantage of the robot, again, is it can be more accurate and it can achieve a higher speed. So when it knows where to go, it actually can do a much higher speed. Now, a human has a really, really big advantage. It's actually the same as in, in dart throwing. Well, you, you do this one flick, right? You do one really fast release of our muscles like a catapult and bang, we already have done a good stroke. And there it's really an unfair advantage, you could say. Um, Jikun actually got to this prediction thing out of two, two triggering reasons. One was that I at some point got to meet the persons of Ra who built these ball guns for, for uh, table tennis, for, uh, the, the, TT, for the, the guys from TT Matic, which is one of the major manufacturers of them. And they said, oh, we cannot predict our ball guns. And that was quite surprising for us. Since, and they told us, well, if we have a five degree error in our spin axis, well, in that case, it can mean a forehand or a backhand. And that triggered for us, okay, there's got to be some more intelligent behavior than just uh, doing physics prediction here happening in humans. That's why we got into, well, why we thought, okay, there's got to be something smarter. And then we had these European champion level players for whom, on whom we did the inverse reinforcement learning. And they told us, well, why do you have these cameras looking at the ball? And for roboticists, that was like, um, yeah, but where else should they look? And they told us, yeah, we are trained not to look at the ball. We are trained to look at the opponent. Of course, they're partially uh, tricking themselves because of course they look at the ball. They wouldn't be able to, to hit it otherwise. But um, the opponent gives them very, very important clues so that they can directly predict the trajectory properly since the visual motor delay for humans is actually quite big. Like it's about 180 milliseconds. So by the time where um, Jikun starts to predict from the movement, then that is only, well, another 100 milliseconds after that, probably there's not gonna be any further movement generated based by the human based on the ball. So he actually has all the information of the human movement 180 milliseconds before the human hits the ball. And um, that's, well, quite, quite an amazing point. Okay. Yes? Do you think we should use like deep learning and generative models to actually predict robots? Because most of the work we have already is like in robotics for hand instrument play. Yes. And then all the vector motion that you're saying apparently is maybe because of the fact that we can't properly choose what mm -hmm. address path to work. So we don't optimize mm -hmm. the path. So it's just like in our head. Mm -hmm. what we see, right? Like if we just let the model generate some new yeah. types of robots, I think. Right. There's I an elastic part, there's the bone, and it just figures yeah. out a combination of them. I think this, this I mean, there, there's a whole field called neuromorphic um, engineering, which somehow tries to put um, evolution on bodies together with the learning, and which is, of course, a super cool problem. Just it's, uh, well, in the end, it's, it's pretty, it's very, very hard because you, excuse me, you have to um, cope now with a lot, uh, well, you have to now build robots, and building a robot is a hard task, right? You need to do at least one PhD for one robot, you could say. So the Barrett Wem, which you saw table playing table tennis there, that was actually the PhD thesis of the head of that company originally, and he has been refining it for 20 something or more, 30 something years by now. 
um, or my PhD student Dieter Büchler is now, after three years, he has a robot with muscles that can actually strike a table tennis ball in the air. And I hope until his defense in a few weeks, he will outperform our Barrett Wem, but um, that is really the, the goal we have there. So that's already a pretty hard thing. I think where learning can really, really help us in robotics is by that current robots are built such that you can control them. So we, we think beforehand, how can we make the motors strong and fast enough that um, we can always overpower the situations, how we can make the sensors accurate enough so that we can, in the worst case, always use feedback instead of a feed-forward component and by that um, become good enough. That we buy that at having a controllable situation where basically a classical nonlinear control works. What I think is key is to actually throw out um, this assumption of trying to build a bad robot so that it is um, that you can use to throw out this idea of building bad robots so that you can control them. You shouldn't go to the other extreme of building even worse robots so that they're cheap, like, I don't know, Blue Robotics does. Yes, um, but you should actually go for the extreme which Sarkos has always aimed at. Build robots which are so fantastic, take from all their theoretical properties, that if you figure out how to control them, you can do amazing things, which nobody else could do before. Since if you really give a system properties, physical properties, is, um, which are hard to use, like let's say muscles, for example, and their catapult effects, you can actually endow a system with, well, human, well, I, I, I would say superhuman ability, right? Um, it's not, but by us trying to stick to build the robots so that we can control them, we are limiting ourselves at the design level. We actually need to aim for the super for human design. But that is really, really hard because you need a classical mechanical engineer who actually is really good at classical mechanical engineering, who's willing to talk to a learning guy and who's willing to cut out the classical controls guy. And that's why it isn't done very frequently in robotics. Yes? So, I mean, right now, this vision system we had back there, there was actually very, very well tuned. I think a very big change in lighting would already have put us into a, to a trouble. Part of it was that um, we had this bizarre idea, we want to live in a lively lab space, so we want to have a hardwood floor. Um, you don't know how many orange balls a 200 hertz vision system sees in a hardwood floor. Um, so we, we really had to, to tune it quite a bit so that we didn't get into uh, to trouble. I think with the, we have a better vision, now we have a much simpler vision system. Um, we moved to a new lab where then we have a gray floor, gray walls, and suddenly a simpler vision system can cope with all kinds of lighting. But lighting is a real problem when you're at high speed too. I mean, you have aperture times where the camera opens for a very short time and can take in very, very little light. You have industrial lenses only um, so that you have, um, you're not um, that you, you don't do so much damage with the lens to the accuracy since you have very few pixels in the end. So uh, th these cameras are not VGA cameras. It opens again at totally two totally different fields. I do think for building vision systems for robotics, we at some point have to abandon this idea of, um, oh, we're going to use computer vision in a classical sense. We have to actually go for um, event-based cameras because event-based cameras are very fast and they tell us really what's happening. Which also, of course, means our representation has to be now recurrent and integrate uh, these signals over time. Um, and in addition to that, we may actually want to move the eyes around, uh, which now um, creates even more problems in practice. Yes? What do you mean by event-based? Okay, so there is a, our eye doesn't work the same way as, as a camera, right? We don't see a hell of a lot of pixels, but we actually, uh, we actually have only have spikes, 
and we, well, in addition to that, move it around all the time to, uh, to sample everywhere. There's a whole family of people who had tried to rebuild um, the it basically from retina to the first kind of virtual circuits to rebuild all of that in hardware and in so that you could actually use this really quite fast. And um, event-based basically means you only send on when a pixel changes, when a photon arrives at a pixel, which obviously means you can do way more pixels, so you get a much higher spatial accuracy. And because every time it's a photon, it also means that, um, that you can go for extremely high sampling frequency. The difference is you have to actually go for, uh, you have to also assume there's a lot of noise in this picture. So you cannot use it um, as a static, computer, static picture for computer vision. So there's a guy who did a really, really cool uh, hacking scenario. So, so pole balancing, the difficulty of pole balancing depends on the length of your pole. Many, most of you guys, uh, if you've only done it in simulation, you never realize that. That any of us can balance after, well, one or two hours of training, the very latest, can balance a pole of a meter length and with a, like, let's say, 500 grams of weight. Now, if I give you a pole of this size, like, uh, take your pen, try to balance it like this here. Just balance, don't do the swing up. Um, just put the finger below. You're not gonna be able to. I don't know anybody who is able to. The reason is that our visual motor delay as a human is already so long that we can't do it. Now there's a guy who actually managed to do this with um, these event-based cameras. Uh, with a well, very simple robot system. Simply because these event-based cameras, they are really fast enough. And that's why they offer a lot of possibilities. I think for autonomous driving, if you really want to make this safe, you also need um, at some point um, some really fast vision there which will make that necessary. But that is a total prediction. I'm not into autonomous driving at all, so I have no clue how truthful that is, what I'm just saying. Disclaimer. Yes? I mean, robotics is kind of, you could say, the superset to AI, because we have all the challenges AI has, any AI has. <laughs> so, um, I mean, take natural language processing, that would be the ideal task description for a robot, right? We wouldn't need any, if, if we could just tell it, uh, give it a, give it here, build me this chair, um, and you, with this description of the chair, right? And parsing that then into robot actions would be great. Computer vision, sub-problem. So this is, this is a really difficult question you're asking there. Um, now, if, um, for all of robotics, I mean, we are, we are nowhere close to the bodies we would like to have in robots. But if you, and the human body is still a marvel to uh, us roboticists, and we hope to reproduce more and more of its properties, but that's a far a step ahead. Um, similarly, yeah, well, you can continue this over sensing over all of the different areas. But if you now just focus on robot learning, which I hope your question was about, <laughs> also um, since not just about bodies, um, then basically I think for robot learning, the big question we need to ask ourselves is really a reinforcement learning question. It's the question of how, end, how much end-to-end -end can we afford to be and how modular and um, how reusable can we try to be. Because we will not manage to do what the natural language processing people have been doing. We will not manage to do what the computer vision people have managed to do or what the, deep, what the deep mind people have been doing with AlphaGo. We will not have this that we have millions of robot hours. And a simulator will not fix this for us. So we have to actually figure out how to now create really this piano from yesterday's hierarchical reinforcement learning talk, this Rich Sutton quote of really figuring out at what level do we want to have the piano and in order to have a concert, well, you probably need more than a piano. You probably need some violin, some um, director, some, and well, you can continue this. So we really have to ask all this, ourselves the question, what is the right level of modularity? How can we actually use, um, 
how should we use unsupervised learning in reinforcement learning? Since it's, we've been very good at using supervised learning for learning policies or for learning value functions as a submodule. But we have actually not, we have no decent answer to how should we use unsupervised learning in RL so that we automatically get the advantages from the deep learning community across even the priors which arise from these data sets, um, the priors which arise from, I don't know, playing Go, um, which are helpful for robotics. Who knows what, what all could be in there? And, but the only way this can transfer is through supervised learning of the right features so that we can actually sit on top of that level uh, and figure out how to be modular on top of that level so that we can focus on what is relevant to our task. And um, I think this is a huge question, and if we solve that, well, that would be a really big step forward. Alrighty. Okay, I guess I'm not going to finish that talk. <laughs> Oh, Boston Dynamics, okay, is a fantastic company, right? Um, now, and it's based on, a, on, Mar on Mark Rabert's work as a professor at MIT, where he did these amazing things where he started with a pogo stick, had the robot, had a pogo stick jump around, then could show, oh, running is easy, I just need to put two pogo sticks together and have them jump around, and then he showed, Galloping and so on is all easy too. You can just um, well concatenate pogo, pogo sticks, and then he got depressed because he realized he, there's nobody and there's n there's no, but neither him nor anybody else in the next 20 years will top this. And this is why he founded Boston Dynamics originally, but as a, originally as a software company. Right now, uh, after they became then a hardware company, they're mainly in one business. And that's the business of turning well military money into great videos. <laughs> now, you could, of course, say this applies to OpenAI, this applies to us and to a lot of other people, but they're very, very good at it. And, um, and they, the, when you look at the, tr at the gates used, for example, by all of the quadrupeds, you recognize the similarity to the gates Mark Rabert already used when he was an MIT professor. So you also recognize, of course, that this is a software base, a very fixed software base, which they have been improving together with a, um, in all this more and more amazing hardware base along for a very long period of time. Mark Rabbit actually, when he was an MIT professor, was a big proponent of um, robot learning. Today, he is actually not. He actually says, why? We can actually hack up the task we really need. Um, so he's quite critical uh, well there. Um, but then again, he says this is very specifically for locomotion. And, um, and I think, so, well, maybe this, maybe he is not totally wrong here about locomotion and about stabilization tasks as well. When you look at us humans, I mean, we humans are kind of a, a, a biological marvel because um, somehow our brain uh, was at some point, we decided, uh, at some point evolution decided to make our brain more energy efficient um, because, well, otherwise we, it became too big and we wouldn't survive birth anymore. And for that reason, we, well, got so incredibly we capable at learning things. But we still kept around a part called the brainstem. And this brainstem is hard-coded up to today. There's no, uh, to my knowledge, there's no learning in the brainstem. And a lot of different basic reflexes sit in the brainstem, and luckily you cannot do anything about that. Like, think about the, the reflex of your heart beating. Imagine if you could unlearn that. <laughs> that would be a very bad accident. So, and that is, for example, hard coded in there. So, putting the right kind of hard coding at the right level may be a very sensible thing. It just has the dis big disadvantage that, well, let's say your robot breaks a leg. Well, you hard coded code will stop working. And you may have to talk to uh, Jean-Baptiste Moret at, at University of Paris, who actually will teach you how to, ha how to have a robot relearn really fast when you break its legs. Um, now that's a different story. And so in that sense, the, 
I mean, the pioneering aspects, the amazing hardware they built, Boston Dynamics is not to be underestimated in any form. I'm not trying to make their success any smaller. Just um, don't get yourself fooled that by having solved one or two of the sub-problems by, by the smartest people who have been in that area here um, for very, well, forever, you could say, um, doesn't tell us much about the rest of robotics and of all the things we want to do. And at some point, we want to have this one motor skill learning framework, which can learn this amazing set of tasks. I mean, evolution hasn't built us to uh, ride bicycles, but pretty much any one of us can, right? And there, in fact, you, ca you could now argue, oh, but bicycles are built so that we can ride them. But even that you can fool again. There is something called the snake bike. You may want to Google that. It's a really cool bicycle. They move the axis backwards. And if you get on it the first time, in the first two days where you ride it, you will not be able to ride it. You have to actually do active learning and relearn your balance controller in order to, uh, to ride it properly. It's fantastic for bets. So if you want to you know, go and have a free beer, just say, hey, I promise you, you can't ride my bicycle. Anybody's taking that bet. And afterwards, free beer is really easy. So <laughs> just Google snake bike or snike, um, they're called. They're not these snakes, by the way. <laughs> OK, now I have nine minutes left. So let me go uh, and 44 slides. Um, you really got me carried away a bit. So let me just go through the major points here. The big advantage for us is, well, we have now this reward-weighted matching where we can l actually do safe reinforcement learning thanks to limiting in the limiting of the damage of our distribution in our trajectories. And this really corresponds to the moment prediction, moment and uh, projection. There is obviously way more you can do if you instead directly work uh, um, work with the other objective where you use the information projection instead. So I want to quickly at least highlight in the last eight and a half minutes that there is, of course, way more on model-based policy search. And um, I do think it's a topic, well, which we have to figure out as well, which goes back to your question, um, figuring out how to use models better is in robotics even more a serious question than in any other area of RL. Since in like, I don't know, let's say for AlphaGo, you don't actually need a better model because we have clear, we have clear rules of the game and we only need opponents. While for a robot, well, the, we basically know all models are bad and um, well, the usefulness can, is very frequently quite limited at, of, well, most models, unless you engineer away the hardware. So you guys obviously know about this loop already. You want to use internal simulations in order to learn a policy, apply the policy to the robot, and then you would do model learning. And people have done this with a huge variety of um, different function approximators, ranging from RBF nets over GPs up to deep neural networks. And we know it's da more data efficient if we can make it work. Now, learning good models is really, really hard. And in robotics, even more so than in most other fields, simply because we have a continuous state action space, which we can never fill up with data, where everything is linked. And if your model has a slight error, this error will not necessarily be on absolute values. Absolute values, well, mean squared error, we directly understand how to, to solve this. In most cases in robotics, it will be on the derivative of things. An error on these derivatives, of course, means that the energy of the um, behavior, which is being transferred in the behavior, will act totally differently than, um, will act totally differently than it would do uh, otherwise, even if you have a 1% error, uh, means normalized mean squared error, this can be completely meaningless if your derivative has a wrong sign. Just again, think about my first failure with the arm going into the joint limits. 
the error was actually that the friction that the some parameters is on the on the velocity would result into a derivative having the wrong sign, a tiny derivative, like a nearly negligible one. But my reinforcement learning policy realized, oh, a derivative wrong direction means, oh, I can actually get energy here because I have negative friction implicitly. Negative friction is really powerful. I can actually get lots of energy for free. And well, that's obviously a try to exploit and well, failed big time. So really, really, really small errors have really, really drastic scaling problems. And most models are either hard to scale or they have to be very, very close to physical assumptions, in which case they're usually also very, very wrong. And then obviously there is a computational complexity question coming along. Now, a learned model as a simulator can actually be used in two different ways. One is by sampling, and one is by approximate inference. And if you really want to use it, uh, it um, optimally in terms of efficiency, you may want to do the latter and not the first. While if, if you want to use it in a way that you get maximum accuracy, you want to may rather want to do the first, and not the latter of the two. And well, you can do this for a variety of things. For example, for getting analytical policy gradients, for trajectory optimization, and also for well, directly applying model-free methods to well, virtual samples. And now let me quickly just point you to two things which you should really read. One thing is the work of Mark Dysonrod, who you learned GP models, and um, then did moment matching as a probabilistic forward model, so that you could actually average over a lot of virtual trajectories, so to speak. And subsequently from this, compute analytically a gradient and update the policy. And the only big disadvantage is that he had to actually come up with a um, very heuristic reward. But what you see here is a pull balancing scenario. And well, you see, and it basically learns to do this within I think 23 seconds of robot time by doing purely random actions by and um, then subsequently always learning a GP model. Now, Mark runs around and makes one strong claim about his, his approach. He says, oh, I'm so super sample efficient. I learn so fast. But I think that's a wrong claim he's making. What is really, really, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's true he's super fast, but I think the, the much more important thing to highlight is, is that the GP captures not only the noise in the transitions, but it actually captures the uncertainty we have about the next state given all the transitions we've seen so far. So you could actually say that his approach is the first, well, the first Bayesian reinforcement learning approach under a given well even reward function, of course, um, that actually works on real systems. And while most of the other Bayesian reinforcement learning things are only useful for tiny toy systems. And that's really the, I think the most impressive contribution and one which is not highlighted sufficiently. And that's why I'm doing this in my last three minutes of this talk. It has been also applied by the way to way more than what you s uh, than card pull. Um, it has been applied for picking up objects with a, uh, with a, this kind of a mobile robot, but with this elephant trunk arm. Um, it has been applied in industry for uh, doing throttle valve control and combustion engines. And I think there it's even going into real production in the foreseeable future. So it's really one industrial application of RL, uh, which, well, if the electric motor doesn't kill, uh, the combustion engine anytime soon may actually have relevance for many of us. Here you see after 17 seconds of experience, so all of this, we basically saw the complete learning along the time. I should add, he was using pretty rudimentary actions since they were really just positive negative actions. He was using a very slow sampling time because the GP is a key bottleneck in the approach. Um, since they're just computationally super expensive. 
but um, it really did an amazing job altogether. Okay, now, yeah, GPs, hard to use, nearly all of these things are somewhat complicated. Now, I guess I don't have time in the last couple of seconds. Um, I have 34 seconds left. Um, I should just say, well, you can, of course, use GP forward models also for a simulator. This can be super cool. So Gary Neumann at some point showed that in simulated table tennis, we are faster by orders of magnitude than the model free methods. And um, well, um, Herke von Hof brought also the GP into the policy then. And I guess, well, I'm not gonna talk about any of the further work of then anymore and just go directly for the conclusion since I've run out of time. So in the end, the model-based methods, they have a really strong model bias. You need to make sure how do you make sure that you don't trust your model and um, you require additional optimization. This is an important and challenging problem um, simply already because it alleviates the sample complexity problem. And um, yeah, we have to still work on many other areas here, like figuring out to be less monolithic, how to have more skill discovery and skill reuse, how to have more task transfer, how to solve the sim to real problem better, and how to do actually more principled reward engineering and algorithm tuning stuff. Sorry that I had to cut the end very short, but I guess our fun discussion before that I got carried away too much. <laughs> and I don't know whether I'm allowed to ask for some more questions, but. Yeah, well, we just have two questions. Two questions still. Alrighty, I think you were first. So I think we, we will definitely figure out how to do, uh, well, how to, how, to, how to really go beyond, I mean, deterministic people and controls are really good by that, right? Deterministic optimal con uh, control of trajectories is, from, is a 1960s problem for the control people. They managed to do the lunar lander with Poitrier against principle, getting a switching controller. They managed to predict, uh, to create the, all the high speed planes um, that way they really figured these things out if you can make your system sufficiently deterministic. They go for very, it only works when you're when you capable of doing very rapid movements, so on off movements um, you, you get this, this to work really well. In the moment where we have modeling errors, stochasticity, the, yeah, we, in the moment where we have modeling errors in any form in there and allow them, probably the smartest way is to do stochasticity. But also because when we cannot just apply an off-the-shelf solution like for, for a particular for a simple linear system for trajectory optimization, for example, for very offline solutions, but if we, if we don't have the, the solutions, well, we need to run an optimizer. And that's actually what the controls guys also did in parallel. So the controls guys formulate everything as one big SQP and then optimize a deterministic system. And they do this, again, really, really well. Just the big difference there is that, um, well, if the model is wrong, they get an arbitrarily wrong answer there. And they, they omit the stochasticity thing because it just simply doesn't fit into these. What you get when you have, of course, a deterministic thing and you're doing a deterministic uh, problem and it's a nonlinear one and you have a well, slightly more complex cost function, your cost function quickly looks like this here, right? It looks like the cost functions of shallow neural networks at the time when we gave up on them. And we gave up on them because the, of these cost functions originally. But for deep networks, the cost functions are much smoother, which is why we like them again. And the same is true when you put stochasticity into your policy and into your system. Then suddenly your cost function looks smooth again. Just the big problem is that we don't have um, methods which are equally good as we had for the simple problems where we can actually make this work in a deterministic scenario. And that's, I think, the, the big frontier and where we have to succeed in order to make this possible. Additionally to that, we have to succeed at branching. So we cannot just do traject one trajectory optimization. We have to really succeed at, well, 
how do we handle the points when we have to, to uh, when we have to maintain more and more different options open? And that's something the controls community isn't even covering. They focus completely on creating one trajectory and then one controller along that. And yeah, but for, de for purely deterministic things, things, you wouldn't need RL. If the world was fully deterministic and linear, no need for RL. Right. Uh, Sorry for the second time. <laughs>